Well, thank you all that participated in the music here this morning. As I said, it's been a real blessing. We now draw our attention to the book of 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is the passage this morning that we're, we're considering. In chapter 6, we come to a passage that is fairly well known, no doubt, uh, to many of you. Uh, it's a passage of scripture that begins in verse 14. And we'll carry on down to chapter 7 and verse 1. In chapter 6, 14, it says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. And he says, For what partnership has, and he asks several questions about being linked up uh, with those who are not people of faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on and he asks a very important question followed by a very important statement. And he makes the statement, for we are the temple, Paul says, of the living God. It makes me stop and it makes me think about our relationship with God. Have you ever stopped to think about why it was that God created in the first place? God, I'm sure, was doing absolutely fine without me. And I'm pretty sure he was doing fine without you. Nothing, nothing personal. But there's God in his, all his wisdom and all his power and in all his might. He creates a world for human beings, namely Adam and Eve as the first created beings, to dwell in. He calls the place where he has prepared for them to live the Garden of Eden. And there's no roof there. There's no house there. Have you ever stopped to think about that? I mean, there was nothing there. There was not even a lawnmower there. But God creates this perfect place for man to live. Now, I believe when you stop and you think about creation, I, I personally believe that, as the scriptures say, that God created it all in six days. I believe that he spoke into existence the planet as we have it. I believe he made man out of uh, dust and creates woman out of man. I believe he does that, all as the scriptures say, because I believe God is very, very intentional in his creation of man. All of the philosophies of the Big Bang and theistic evolution lead to millions of years. And I don't see the intentionality of God by taking millions of years for something to, to mutate down into what looks like you and me. God had a very specific plan in mind when he creates the world and when he creates man and woman. His whole point was to create beings that he could have fellowship with. Now that's pretty amazing, but it's exactly what happens in the Garden of Eden. The Bible describes Adam and Eve there in the garden, and it describes God walking with them in the cool of the evening. They are having this amazing fellowship there in the garden. And the only thing that would create a barrier to that fellowship would be sin. And we know by one man sin entered into the world and things began to change. This morning, we're going to stop and look at a passage of scripture that screams from God's point of view, I want to have fellowship with my creation. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we ask this morning that you would just open our hearts and our minds to the spirit of God's working in his word. Help us, Father, this morning to understand your great desire to have fellowship with your creation. May we see it from your point of view. May we understand the significance of what the scriptures say. And I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let me spell it out for you this way. This morning, uh, let me just say that we have been invited by God to have a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And God desires for this relationship to absolutely thrive. How can we make the most of this opportunity is a, a key question. How does, that, how does that all work out? How do we make it real? 
Well, verse 16 is going to tell us here, for we are the temple of the living God, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then he goes on and he makes his declarative statement. Let me make the first point this morning, and that is that we are the living sanctuary or the living temple of God. If you are a person of faith, there has been a change, and because of that change, the results of that change are that you are now the dwelling place of God Almighty. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. Now, the Bible is pretty clear here. All the way back into the Old Testament, we see where God has desired to have a relationship uh, with his people. You may recall that going back to a man named Abram, he called him uh, out of his land uh, and said, I'm going to make of you a brand new nation, and it's going to be a nation that is set apart to me. In Leviticus chapter 26, we pick that up and we read there, He says uh, very clearly, moreover, in verse 11, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves, and I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Very similarly in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we see the same wording. He says in Leviticus, I will set my tabernacle in you. 2 Corinthians 6 says, I will live with them, I'll walk among them. In Leviticus, he says, I will walk among you and I will be your God. 2 Corinthians 6 says, and I will be their God and they will be my people. God had this plan from the very beginning to have a relationship with his creation, but because of sin and the decision that's made there in the Garden of Eden, sin has broken that relationship. What God wants to do next is to salvage it, and so he calls Abram out of his land, he puts him in a new land, and he builds for himself a great nation. Now here's the plan. The problem was the people of Israel end up in Egypt. And so God makes it very clear that I brought you out of Egypt because I had plans for you. I want to have a relationship with you. When they come out of the land of Egypt, God brings about the sacrificial system so that sin could be covered, so that there could be a relationship between sinful people and a holy God. Now that's pretty amazing that our God loves us that much that he wants to have a relationship with us all. It's exactly what he wants to do. Jeremiah, if you go with me to Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah, in the midst of his uh, prophesying, uh, is going to mention something that is uh, future fulfillment. And he mentions this, and it's interesting because the people have been off in Babylon for decades now, and uh, it appears that, uh, you know, there's not a lot of good things happening, but all of a sudden you realize that God isn't done with his people still. And even though they're exiled, God is going to do some mighty things with them. Jeremiah prophesies, and he's going to prophesy about something that is future yet, even to the people going back to Israel. Notice in chapter 31, verse 31, he says, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Now, this is a big declaration. Uh, God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is making a declaration whereby everyone who's in hearing distance should stop and listen, because this is pretty important. He says, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. He says, although I was a husband to them. God says the old covenant, the first covenant. It was the Mosaic covenant. It basically said that if you do obey me, I will bless you. But if you disobey me, if you break the covenant, I will bring curses upon you. This is the old covenant. And God says, I was in a relationship with the people of Israel. And he says, even though I was a husband to them. Do you understand what that means? He's basically saying, even though I was married to them, 
they broke it. God had a relationship with the people of Israel whereby there were some opportunities for great fellowship. And still the people pushed God away and they break the covenant with God. And so the old covenant is, is broken. It needs to be fixed. There needs to be a new covenant. And Jeremiah is referencing this new covenant. He says, I'm going to make this new covenant, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make, he says, with the house of Israel. After that day, those days, he says, uh, and he declares it, I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I'll write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man the neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. That is a reference there, and it gets me excited when I think about it, but this is the millennial kingdom where this is absolutely fulfilled to the T uh, that Jeremiah is prophesying about. Now understand, the new covenant begins, and, and the seedlings of it is what we're about to celebrate with regard to Christmas. That is the Messiah coming. Jesus Christ comes, and he inaugurates the new covenant. It is not fulfilled for the people of Israel until you get to the millennial kingdom, but it is amazing what God has done. And why has he done that? Why is he doing this? Why is he putting up with sinful human beings like you and me? It is because he, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. You see, the love of God is amazing. He wants to be in a relationship with us. And so to see that fulfilled, there needs to be some serious changes. Notice with me back in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus, Leviticus. We're going to go back to Leviticus and uh, looking here at uh, chapter uh, 26 and, and also chapter uh, 27 there. We see uh, that there is without a doubt in the heart of God a desire uh, to have a vibrant relationship with the people. And I'm just going to look here at chapter 26 and verse 11. Moreover, he says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. I'll walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. I broke the bars of your yoke and made you to walk erect. Ezekiel tells us that there are some serious changes that have gone on. Ezekiel chapter 36, very clearly uh, in chapter 36 and in chapter 37, uh, it's, it's amazing what he's saying here. But he's going to tell us that there are some serious changes. I'm going to give them, he says, a new heart. I'm going to, to change you. Verse 26 of chapter 36. Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Chapter 37 in verse 26 of Ezekiel says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and I will, it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. God desires fellowship with his creation. Even though we've sinned, even though we're sinful, even though we have disappointed God time and time and time again, God seeks to place within us a new heart. First or Second Corinthians chapter three, we kind of came through that that passage in the very beginning of chapter three, we talked about God setting in us a, a, a new heart. This is what it's all about, and God recognizes that this is, this is pretty significant. We want to have a new relationship with God. We don't just want something old. We want something that's, that's new. Colossians chapter one, verse 21 says, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, Engaged in evil deeds, 
Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So understand, the first point this morning is God wants a relationship with us. Isn't that phenomenal? And he understands the significance of sin more than any single one of us understands it. And yet he is willing to do everything necessary in order to have a relationship with us. What then does he expect from us? What is his point of view? Notice with me the the five questions that don't demand answers there in 2 Corinthians 6. Paul is going to talk about these things. He's going to give it to us uh, pretty straight up. And he's going to ask these questions here, and he's really compelling us to live a life that's separated to him in order for this fellowship to to really thrive. He asks literally, and this is what literally it says, for what in common? Righteousness and wickedness. And there's no answer to that other than there's nothing in common, correct? We would all agree. There's nothing in common. You don't have any commonness between righteousness and wickedness. Interestingly, as Paul gives these five statements, there's not a verb in there, so it's pretty raw as I'm just kind of interpreting it. It doesn't even read smoothly, and I believe it's by design. There, He's trying to get the attention uh, to the reality of these contrasts, and he doesn't care that it's not smoothly or eloquently read. What in common, righteousness and wickedness? What fellowship, he says, light with darkness? You know, light and darkness have nothing in common. They are totally separated. If you have a situation where it's absolutely pitch, pitch, dark, black, no light whatsoever, you cannot see the hand in front of your face, can you? If there's just a little bit of light, just a tiny little bit of light, you have light. You either have light or you have darkness. Sometimes we have a lot of light. Sometimes we have very little light, but you're either in total darkness, and very few of us find ourselves in total darkness. Do you want to be in total darkness? Close your eyes. No, I'm just kidding. You know and understand that darkness does not exist with light. If there's just even a little bit of light, you don't have darkness. Paul is trying to make this a very clear-cut example of a stark contrast. He asks the next question. He says, but what harmony of Christ to Belial? And Belial is an interesting term. It's a a name he's using here for Satan. Um, I I won't bore you with the history of the term, but it's not a common term uh, in the day. It's not a common term in the New Testament. But it gets our point across, doesn't it? Is there fellowship between Jesus and Satan? I don't think so. Uh, What do they have uh, that that bridges it and brings them together? Nothing. There's no harmony between the two. And Paul makes that very, very clear. Then he asks, he says, but what portion or what portion by a believer with an unbeliever? Oh, interesting. He's talking about relationships of people with faith and no faith. But what union, he asked, by the temple of God with idols. And this last one really brings to bear some of the significance uh, and reasoning behind what Paul is trying to say, or better understood what God's point really is. So God wants to have fellowship with us as sinful human beings. The question is, will we allow sin to coexist in that relationship and hamper the relationship so that the relationship fails to thrive? Think of it this way. The Corinthians are coming from a very wicked background. They're placing their faith in Jesus Christ, and that is applaudable. Is applaudable a word? I don't know. The problem was many of them failed to come out from the religion of the day, breaking free from that and being sold out in their allegiance to Jesus Christ. There were, as we would understand it, a very complex religious culture that you would have to break free from in order to have a sweet fellowship with Christ. Corinth is such a wicked place. I think it's hard for us sometimes to even understand. 
It was commercially prosperous because of its location primarily, but it was a place that had a reputation. You could be Corinthicized. That is, you would start to act in such a manner. And they had a Greek word that they used to use for people who would commit behavior that was very typical in Corinth. Are you, are you with me? Uh, if um, in the Greek language this word was used to Corinthize or to be a Corinthian, it meant to live with drunken and immoral debauchery as the commonness of your life. Great reputation. You see, you could be from outside of Corinth and you could live like a Corinthian. And that's what people would say. One person who writes, he was a Greek writer, uh, Aelion, said that if a Corinthian was, was shown on the stage and the, the Greeks were big for their big plays, uh, that if he was depicted as a Corinthian on a Greek stage for a play, he was always, always depicted as a roaring drunk. Great place to be from, for sure. God is saying, I want you to come out from that type of wickedness. As we would understand it, Corinth was one of those horrifically wicked places religiously as well. And for you to be entwined with the religion of the day was very complicated. It wasn't just simplistic. But it was a little isthmus there in Corinth, and that led to the shipping, and it led to the prosperity of the city. High up on that isthmus was the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. There were 1,000 active temple prostitutes who lived there. And at night, they came down into the city into the city streets to ply their trade. Now, we know the temptations of our day with multitudes of different things and technology and so forth, but it's not that much different from what went on in the past in certain places. You see, temptation's always been around. Wickedness has always been around. And this is great wickedness here in Corinth. And it caused people to have to make decisions as to what their level of commitment was going to be to this newfound Savior. You see, Jesus wants to have a thriving relationship, but again, the sin is the problem. Here's uh, some things that uh, Barclay says in his commentary, which I find fascinating, especially in light of where we are in 2017. But he writes this decades ago, and he says, Uh, what does it mean to be separate uh, in your Christianity for Christ? He says of the Corinthians, it meant often that a man had to give up his trade. Suppose he says you were a stonemason. What was to happen if his firm received a contract to build a heathen shrine? Suppose he was a tailor. What was to happen if he was instructed to cut and sew garments for priests of the heathen gods? Suppose he was a soldier at the gate of every camp there burned uh, the light upon the altar that was sacred to the godhead of Caesar. What was to happen if he had to fling his pinch of incense on that altar in token of his worship to Caesar? You see, there's always a cost of discipleship, isn't there? always a cost of discipleship. There's a man who came to one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, and he said to Tertullian, uh, as he was explaining his problem to Tertullian about uh, separation and what he couldn't do and what he could do, and after a while he looked at Tertullian and he said, but after all, he says, I must live. And Tertullian turned and looked at him and said, you must Interesting question. F.W. Charrington was an heir to a fortune that was made by brewing. He passed uh, by a tavern one night. And there was a woman waiting at the door. A man, obviously her husband, came out, and she was trying to keep him from going back in. And with one blow of his fist, uh, he felled her. Charrington started forward, and then he looked up. The name above the tavern was his own. 
Charrington said, with that one blow, that man did not only knock his wife out, but he also knocked me clean out of that business forever. And he walked away from his fortune. You see, no man is a, as Barclay says, a keeper of another man's conscience. But certainly there are things in our life, as we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, that cause us to pause and to look at our own life. Because after Paul makes these five uh, rhetorical questions, he makes the statement and he simply says that what God's exhortations are is that we would come out from uh, among them, he says, and be separated unto God. That's what this whole idea of a sanctuary is or being holy. It means to be set apart to something. It's not just the negative. It's being set apart to God. And he says, do not touch that which is unclean, that which would cause us to stumble. These exhortations are clear. In the 1300s, they decided that they would put chapter breaks in the New Testament here actually in the Bible, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and this passage of scripture here, doesn't end until chapter 7 and verse 1. But before I, I go there, again, God says, I will dwell in them, walk among them, be their God, they'll be my people. Therefore, verse 17, come out from their midst and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. I'll be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to me. God desires a relationship with you. And that means that you and I need to come by faith to him and express faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. But it doesn't stop there. Notice with me in conclusion, chapter 7, verse 1. Paul loves to use that word, therefore. It kind of wraps up the thoughts. And he says this. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. When he uses that word perfecting, perfecting holiness, he's basically saying this, and it's the same word that we would interpret as completing. Bring to completion, he says, that, that sanctification. And what we're talking about is that process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ that began at the moment of our salvation and will continue until the time when we are no longer here on earth. But this process of sanctification is something that you and I as Christians should give attention to. We need to look at our lives. We need to cleanse ourselves, he says, because this is what we need to do in order to have the relationship that we are seeking with God. God wants the relationship that you and I have with him to flourish. It means he wants the spirit of the Lord to be speaking to our heart as we get on our face and we pray. God wants to answer prayer. He wants us to know that he is real. He wants us to know that he is there. God wants nothing more than to open up his word to you. And as you look into the word of God, his spirit will take the words off those pages and place the truth into your heart. God wants to have a vibrant relationship with you as a follower of his. But let's remember that it is that one little word, sin, that provides the barrier to what he wants to accomplish in our lives. Key points to consider. God didn't just, and I use that word just very carefully here. You, you need to understand how I say that. But God, maybe I should say only. God did not only send Jesus here to pay our penalty to give us a get out of hell free card. He paid the penalty so that we would have the opportunity to enjoy a relationship with him forever. That's what he wants. And the second point we need to remember, it's the intention of the Lord that that relationship that flourishes, that's vibrant, that's thriving, is normative in our hearts and lives. This is what he desires this is why God has gone to all the trouble through all the ages. Don't you see it? 
Yes, there is coming a time when this old body will die and I will go into the presence of the Lord and I will be there in heaven for all of eternity. And that is wonderful. And my relationship with God will thrive there. But when you read the scriptures, God wants our relationship to thrive here. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, I'm just waiting for my spiritual retirement. Then you're missing the blessing of what God intended for you. Let's pray. As we take a moment to just look into our own hearts today, there's a couple of questions that come to mind that we should ask ourselves. The first question we should ask is, do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have I placed my faith and trust in him Or am I seeking in another way to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven? If God is speaking to your heart this morning, let me urge you this morning to make that decision to place faith in Christ a reality in your life. It is the first step to having a relationship with God. Remember Colossians 1.21, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in your mind, God has reconciled you to himself through Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you are still alienated from God, he is opening his heart to you. The spirit of God is is doing the work. And I trust that you won't leave here this morning until you're certain that you have a personal faith in Christ, a personal relationship with him. You may be here this morning as a follower of Christ. And you look at your relationship with God and it's less than vibrant. I think all of us would probably look at our lives and say, boy, even if you've been a Christian for a short period of time or a Christian for a long period of time, uh, at times God's been disappointed with us. Uh, I would say that all of us would probably have in common the desire to have a more vibrant relationship with Christ. And sin is the barrier to that. That's why when we sin, we need to make sure that it is confessed and forsaken as soon as possible. God provides that in his word. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. We know that's a reality. God wants to set the relationship back where it needs to be, but he's waiting for you to call on him with repentance. As a follower of Christ, are you thriving in your relationship with Christ? That is his purpose in creating you in the first place. You're here this morning, God speaking to your heart. Let me just encourage all of us right now as we bow our heads to take a moment and pray. God knows where you are in your relationship with him, and so do you. Uh, The rest of the world may know, may be fooled, or, or may have confirmation. Uh, people may look at your life and say, boy, there's a person who's really walking with God. And, and Enoch was a man in the Old Testament that people looked at and said, there's a man who walks with God. It's very, very true in reality for many. But maybe you're here this morning and there are things in, in places in your heart and life that you know need to be addressed in order for the relationship to thrive. God speak in your heart this morning. I just want to urge you today to make this right with God. Our care and concern folks will be here at the front. If you want to pray with someone, you want to talk to somebody. Don't leave here with questions. If you're not sure about your eternal destination, don't leave here until you're satisfied and there's peace in your heart. Maybe as a a Christian, God's been speaking to your heart. Maybe you'd like to come forward here and, and just pray up here. I invite you to do that. As God is at work in your heart. Let's all stand, shall we? Lord, I just want to come before you and thank you for loving us as much as you do. To going through all of those steps, Lord, is just amazing. Creating us in the first place and dealing with all of the brokenness of our contracts with you in the past and Lord uh, ultimately to bring about the coming of Messiah 
leading to his death on the cross so that we can have our sin paid for. It's a real blessing, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the new covenant and the blood of Jesus Christ. May we, Lord, as followers of yours, understand the significance of what you desire from us. Help us, Lord, to see our Christian life from your perspective. A God whose desire is to pour out blessings and see his children just thrive. Father, I pray that we would recognize the sin that holds us back. That we would deal with it, Lord, aggressively. That, Father, you would be pleased. Work in the hearts, Lord, I pray, of those who may be here this morning who aren't sure about their eternal destination. Lord, I just pray that they would seek answers before they leave here this morning. May you be glorified, I pray, in all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave this morning, just a few announcements. I know it's probably good.